Welcome to Brain and Vats. We are delighted to be joined by Matt Lutz. We've been hearing about Matt for many years because he's a close friend of Spencer Case, and this is really a companion episode to the one that we've released with Spencer regarding whether morality is real. And now we're going to hear the other side of the debate, um, why people are complete suckers for believing in the existence <laughs> of morality. Matt, would you like to start with the thought experiment? Sure. Um, uh, I'll start with the thought experiment that I pose in the book. And the thought experiment is this. Um, what if there were no categorical normativity? By which I mean, what if there were no such thing as to be done this or to be pursuing this? What if there was nothing that you had to do, not because you wanted to do it, but nothing that you had to do just because, so to speak? If there was nothing that was to be done, what would you do? Would you sit on the couch and slump into an endless despair? Would you do nothing? I guess that's one possibility. But in a sense, if you chose to do nothing, you would still be choosing to do something, to slump down on the couch in despair. Uh, some people are disabled in certain ways so that perhaps they have no rational control over their actions. But for non-disabled uh, human agents, our actions are controlled by rational deliberation. And if you choose to do nothing, you would be choosing to do something. So again, what would you choose to do? Would you choose to sit on the couch or would you choose to get up and walk around and pursue the things that you desire and uh, promote the things that you care about promoting and uh, act the way that you want to act in the world? I think quite clearly you would do the latter rather than the former. And of course, this is not merely a thought experiment. I think that this is an actual description of our actual state of affairs and that are acting in ways that we want to act to do what we want to do to pursue what is meaningful to us is how we actually live our lives. And we don't need morality to live our lives in that way. So is the idea that uh, we have reasons for action without talking about moral reasons. So we have reasons for doing things in everyday life. We're get getting up in the morning, treating our neighbors well, going about our day, um, and we don't have to use moral uh, imperatives and moral judgments to explain why we do that and why we should. Yes, exactly. Uh, so the view that I defend uh, in the book is a version of a what's known as a Humean theory of reasons or a Humean theory of normativity, which says that all of reasons and rationality simply amounts to figuring out how to get what you want. Now, when I say it that way, it has a certain sort of egoistic cast to it, right? Uh, you're looking out for number one. You're just getting what you want, what you know, is in your own egoistic interest. But that's really a misunderstanding of what uh, the Humean theory amounts to. Because as Hume pointed out, a lot of what we want, a lot of what we care about is the happiness and well-being of others. And uh, this is both a product of socialization and uh, a product of our just sort of natural inclinations as social animals, right? Who live in societies, who have families and friends that we care deeply about. And so when we act in accordance with our desires, when we act in a way to get what we want and to pursue what we care about, we'll ultimately end up acting in ways that have us pursuing the, um, the best interests of the people who matter to us, which I hope is many, many people. So it strikes me as odd that you would hope that. Um, in other words, when you say, I wish that this thing would be the case, it might be because you have a peculiar set of desires where you want other people to prosper. But let's say you're Genghis Khan and you say, what I want is as much blood on my sword as is possible. I want to see people suffer and scream. I want to conquer as much territory as possible. I want to rape as many women as possible. Now, on a human line, it's very simple what you need to do. If you want those things, then you should be as bloodthirsty and vicious as possible. You should lop off as many heads as possible, and you should rape as many women as possible. And Genghis Khan hopes that to be the case. <laughs> now, you, I imagine, would not want that. But that's just your peculiar preference. It's like you like ice cream. I like chocolate sauce. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. There's no objective answer to those questions, right? Yes and no. <laughs> I like the idea of being a sword blood maximizer, right? That's one way to live one's life. Um, 
but uh so in in a sense yeah um my caring about other people is a a uh, peculiar idiosyncratic desire to myself. And on the other hand, it's not particularly peculiar or idiosyncratic at all. Uh, I care about other people in my life. Mark, so do you. So do so sure, both yeah. of you. Um, so we're going three out of three, right? Um, I think the vast majority of people uh, end up caring about others. Um it is not a strange and idiosyncratic state of affairs to care about the well-being of others. It is a strange and idiosyncratic affairs to not care about the well-being of others. So in a certain sense, yeah, sure, it's all just contingent, a matter of my own personal idiosyncrasies, but I've got my personal idiosyncrasies for, for good reasons, um, so to speak. And uh, so does everybody else. And a society that's founded entirely on people just acting out their own uh, concerns and cares for others will be a pretty nice, peaceful society. I say that because our society is, in fact, a society which is founded on people just acting out their own idiosyncratic likes and cares for others. And it's a pretty good society, give or take. But the so, model, we should... I think we're going to say exactly the same thing. <laughs> So if we look at the evolution of morality over time, just descriptively, what you have is that people look after themselves, their family, their tribe, their nation, their race, and eventually they start to think it's all human beings. Maybe they start to think it's all beings with the capacity to suffer. Now, that shows you a sort of change over time. Um, it just happens to be that we live in a society now where people happen to care about those beyond their immediate circumstances. But when we're comparing the two societies, there's nothing better or worse on your view. They're just different. It's a mere difference. If you like, um, you know, whether you have, um, whether you're in a wheelchair or not in a wheelchair, if you take that view of disability, they're just different. You know, whether you speak uh, English or Afrikaans or Spanish, it's just different. Um, but when you say things like nice, that seems to imply some level of judgment that that is preferable. So I imagine you have certain preferences. But you think that you could have different preferences. Someone who says, I, I want to live in a world um, where we beat up black people and um, the laws are structured in a way that uh, we aren't punished for it. In fact, we're celebrated for it. Um, you're just going to say, well, that's the rule set that they came up with. There's nothing good or bad about it. It's just a particular rule set, right? Sure, in some sense, but in another sense, no. Uh, so an important thing to remember here is that we don't evaluate or um, deliberate from the God's eye view, right? I don't stand outside myself and say, how shall I live my life? Neither do I stand outside myself and say, what shall I think of Genghis Khan? Or because I'm standing outside of myself, what shall be thought of Genghis Khan by some unspecified individual might be mad, might be, doesn't matter, right? Um, were I per impossible to occupy the God's eye view position, then um, to occupy the no position, then I would have no basis for judgment or evaluation or action or anything like that. But I don't. It is a very deep feature about myself and about my practical liberation and my engagement with the world um, as an actor and as a valuer that I act from my own deliberative and evaluative perspective. And my own deliberative and evaluative perspective is suffused with my own wants, cares, and desires. So sure, if I were a non-person entity viewing myself from heaven, then there would be no basis for deciding one way or the other which sort of society would be better. But that's not how things work. I am me. And I have my own wants and cares and desires. And these are very deep facts about my own practical agency and about my own understanding of the world and my own situation within the world. So from a non-position, which I don't occupy and which no one could occupy, there's no basis for pursue, uh, for in one society to the other. But from my own position, from my own position as an agent who cares about things, then I have every reason to prefer a certain sort of society. I have the best reason to prefer a certain sort of society and really the only kind of reason that I could have. 
And the mistake that moral realists make, the fundamental mistake that moral realists make, is by taking their own perspective that they have and thinking that perspective would hold if somehow they were per impossible in the no position. That the perspective that they have, the values that they have, the things that they care about, have this property of to be cared aboutness, which would be recognized by anybody who is looking at it from a no position. But of course, that's ridiculous, right? The uh, values that we perceive in the world are values that we put in the world, that we project into the world, to use a fairly common term in this literature, um, uh, in virtue of the fact that we essentially, inescapably, see the world from our own deliberative and evaluative perspective. I find it very interesting that you call it the no position because that makes it sound really weird. It right? does sound It makes really it sound weird. like it's very strange. Yeah. And it gives plausibility to this idea that we can't access it. Um, you know, there's another term for it, which we use all the time, which seems very accessible, which is just the objective facts, right? So we say, what are the objective features of the situation? And you're saying, oh, the objective features, if I understand correctly, if I understand your position correctly, you're saying... The objective features of a situation are the features that you would see from the no position. You can't occupy that position. And how sure are you that those objective features are the features that they have? Um, and you know what, what, object, uh, uh, what moral realists say all the time is things like, objectively, it is the case that it is wrong to mow down a field of school children with an AK-47. It's wrong to do that. Um, objectively, it's wrong to do that. And you're saying, well, you can't put yourself in a position to really know that. And I find that weird. I find that weird. I would love to know the reasoning that you could use to suggest that mowing down those children isn't wrong. You know what? It seems like no matter what my, uh, my subjectivity is like, what my upbringing is like, what my intuitions are like, it's very hard for anyone to substantiate the position that mowing down those children is the right thing to do. Sure. So we're pivoting here slightly. I've been talking about metaphysics and practical rationality so far, broadly speaking. Let's talk about epistemology a little bit. Um, because to a large extent, uh, the position that I'm defending here is driven by epistemology. Uh, the reason why I have the views that I have is precisely because I think that there is no way to justify uh, belief in uh, any sort of objective moral facts. Um, and so to make that case, then we need to get into a little bit of epistemology. And we can ask, how do people have a reason to believe anything? Uh, and this is... Uh, maybe I caught a note of it in what you were saying, right? Uh, it, one way of um, framing your objection to, to get away from morality a little bit, right? If I'm casting doubt on the no position, then I'm casting doubt on objectivity. And if I'm casting doubt on objectivity, well, that, that seems crazy because there, of course, there are objective facts about the world, right? And here's a cup. That's an objective fact about the world, right? Here's my book. It's an objective. See, I'm selling uh, that's an objective fact about the world, right? So there are these objective and, and those objective facts would be true even if we were, didn't have the perceptual capacities, uh, if we didn't have eyes, there still would be a book in front of you. If you didn't have hands to feel it, it still would have a certain shape. Um, so even if we are lacking in the ability to directly perceive the world, there is still there are still objective facts about the world. And the moral realist is saying, well, counted in those facts are facts about moral states of affairs. Great. Perfect. So we're on the same page. Um, then this just raises uh, a general sort of epistemic question about what are the sort of things that we should believe in and how can we come to have knowledge of objective matters of fact about things that exist independently of us and independently of our minds? Is there a way of coming to know about things outside of ourselves? I think that, yes, of course there is. Of course, we can have knowledge of objective matters of fact of various kinds. Um, but I think that our ways of knowing about the world are not 
ways that can tell us anything about an objective moral reality. So my uh, moral error theory, my moral nihilism, if you want, uh, my skepticism is driven primarily by epistemology. Um, I am of the, my, my general sort of uh, epistemological slash metaphysical view is that if you don't have good reason to think that something exists, then you shouldn't think that it exists. And I don't think we have good reason to think that moral facts exist. And so I don't think that they exist. Um, now we can talk about the, uh, the various sorts of intuitions, how terrible it might seem to be, right, to consider certain sorts of uh, states of affairs, right? Mowing down the, the children with the AK-47 or whatever, right? Um, can, I can fully explain why that seems terrible to me by simply appealing to the sorts of attitudes that I have and the, what it is like to think about the world from an evaluative perspective. However, when it comes time to uh, explain why I have certain other sorts of experience, like the visual and tactile experiences of the cup in front of me, then... Uh, in order to explain why I have those sorts of experiences, I'm going to have to evoke the existence of a real objective cup. Well, uh, some of your viewers uh, might be familiar with this uh, famous argument from uh, Gilbert Harmon, uh, who says that there is an important difference uh, between scientific properties, natural properties, broadly construed, and moral properties which is that we can have, we have the capacity to know about scientific properties, objective, natural properties by a process of inference, the best explanation, but we don't have a way of knowing about moral facts by a process of inference to the best explanation. And that's the crucial disanalogy between the moral and the natural physical world of tables and chairs and coffee cups and brilliantly written books. Um, and, uh, that is why I believe in tables and chairs and coffee cups and brilliantly written books, which may or may not include mine. Uh, and I don't believe in moral facts. So I understand the idea that you want to limit your metaphysics, right? You don't want to be believing in magical objects, angels, demons, unicorns. And uh, in the book, you describe the shock that you felt when you were in a moral philosophy class and everyone's a moral realist. And you say, it's like, being around a group of biologists who believe in unicorns, there's some magical thinking. I can't touch or taste this morality. I can't see it anywhere. It seems like you've just posited it. Um, and you know, you're saying if we remove the metaphysics, most people happen to have grown up in a society where they treat each other with some kind of respect. They're worried about being punished by the law. So you can just toss the metaphysics like you know, there are many atheists who you know, grew up believing that there was a God and God was going to shove a lightning bolt up your bum if you misbehaved, and then they stopped believing in God, but they still behaved. You know, just toss off the illusions and you'll be fine. Um, I wonder about what else you have to shed. So is it all values? So do you think you referenced meaning at the beginning? Um, I'm going to give you a case that came up through Thad Metz, one of our favorite guests. Thad says... Imagine that you've got someone who tells they lead an incredibly meaningful life. And you say, oh, what do you do? So, well, I start off the morning by ensuring that I have a very precise number of hairs on my head and I pluck extra hairs that are there. I then go and I go to the um, driving licensing department and I start at the back of the queue. And as soon as I get to the front, I go to the back. And I do that for a couple of hours every day. <laughs> I have uh, blades of grass. Uh, then I eat my own shit. And then I rewatch episodes of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And all of this... I think is subjectively meaningful and therefore is meaningful. Well, at least the last. And he said they must. Be. <laughs> so he says that person just appears mistaken. It's true that they believe that stuff to be meaningful doesn't matter. That there's some objectively meaningful things in the world, and he thinks that's the pursuit of truth, beauty, and goodness. Now, I imagine that you can't make that move. That you can't say there are objectively meaningful things in the world because we can't. You know, you're going to reject the goodness outright. There's no such thing as moral facts. Uh, truth, maybe you can say, okay, there are true things. I don't know if you can evaluate that and say that it's good or bad to believe in true stuff or not. You could just say, hypothetically, if you want to find out what's true, this is the method to get there. Uh, but if you don't want to find out what's true, then you use a different method. 
And then on beauty, you know, I think you're going to say, well, it's not clear to me that things that are necessarily more beautiful or ugly than others, you know, that's just a matter of personal preference. And so I think you're going to have to say meaning can't exist in any objective sense as well. It'd be right. Meaning is a strange term. Uh, when people talk about uh, living a meaningful life, I'll indulge in that way of talking every now and again. But I, I've always felt a little bit uh, uncertain about what people are even talking about when they talk about the meaningful life, right? Uh, I've always been uh, partial to the old philosopher joke, if you want to know the meaning of the word life, you look in the dictionary. That's the only sense in which you can talk about the meaning of life, right? When people talk about uh, having a meaningful life, I mean, the best sense I can make of that is a life that uh, you are happy with, or that are comfortable with, that provides you with a sense of satisfaction, which is deeper, perhaps, than the sort of passing pleasures that you get from uh, watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And so I think what it takes to have a meaningful life, in that sense, then, is for you to satisfy certain desires of yours, and I use desire in a very broad sense here, um, which are central to you in a certain sort of way. Hard for me to uh, explain, but the sort of uh, desires such that the satisfaction of those desires gives this deep, profound sense of contentment that we would associate with uh, living a meaningful life. Um, and it is, again, in some sense, purely a contingent matter. Um, what sorts of desires I have that would um, result in that sort of feeling from having them be satisfied. So, you know, imagine this uh, strange individual, right, who gets that sort of um, not merely uh, the sort of uh, relief that you get when you scratch an, uh, an itch, right? Um, this sort of thing that you get from satisfying a compulsion by plucking the hairs on your head, right? Um, Someone who feels the same sort of sense of contentment and joy that someone like you and I would get from having a meaningful relationship with a spouse, raising a family, things like that. Um, that seems bizarre to me, right? I have a huge amount of difficulty imagining what it would like to be that kind of person. And that just shows that I'm not that kind of person, right? That sort of imaginative leap into that sort of phenomenology is be very hard for me to do. Uh, I don't know what it's like to be that kind of person, just like I don't know what it's like to be a bat. Um, but if such a person existed, seems bizarre, but if they did, um, then yeah, if they lived their life that way, that would make perfect sense for them from their deliberative perspective. Of course, when I'm evaluating them, and I can evaluate them because, again, evaluation is something that I do from my own personal perspective. The way of living their life will seem bizarre to me because the desires that they are satisfying, if indeed they are desi uh, satisfying desires like this, are so bizarre and so alien to my way of experiencing the world um, that I can't make sense of that. So I assume that other people have desires much like mine. and will feel satisfaction under approximately the same conditions that I feel satisfaction. Um, and so somebody who lives their life in a very different sort of way will seem to me to be making a mistake because I'll presume that the same sorts of things will satisfy them and satisfy me. And so what they're doing is something just crazy. And I think it's plausible that somebody who actually lived their life like that would be doing something crazy, right? It might be impossible in human psychology for someone to be so constituted as to feel that sort of deep feeling of satisfaction they get by just circling the queue at the, uh, the DMV all day long. Um, but if such an individual were possible and they did live their life in that way, then from their perspective, they would be living a meaningful life. I would still continue to find their life bizarre because again, I'm stuck in my own perspective and fundamentally incapable of understanding the satisfaction they get from living in their perspective. Um, so I will perhaps inescapably see their actions as making some sort of mistake, but from the deliberative perspective of such a bizarrely constituted agent, I can't come up with a sense in which they, from their own perspective, would be making a mistake by their own lights. So I think the position that you're defending is too strong 
In other words, it's not as it's stronger than it needs to be. Um, you're arguing that there aren't moral facts. And if I understand correctly, that there's at least not a certain sort of normativity in the world. I'm not sure if you permit some sorts of nor normativity, but there's certain types of normativity that just aren't there. So there, there aren't um, right and wrong actions. I assume you want to say something like there aren't better or worse situations. Um, they might be for the person, but not objectively um, from the no position. Um, why say on top of that something like, well, you could have a society of moral, of, of error theorists or moral anti-realists and society would be just fine. Why say that? Why not, wh why not say, well, but it might be fine, it might not be fine. I don't know. Um, it just is the case that there aren't moral facts. Um, there's a whole lot of people be who believe there are, but they're wrong. And if they believe differently, who knows what it would be like? Why defend the further claim that actually society would be just fine? Um, people would still get up in the morning. They would still do things. Um, like why defend that further claim? So there's, um, we should distinguish between two things here, right? Um, the thought experiment that I began with is not a society of error theorists, a society of people who believe that there is no meaning in the world uh, or no morality or nor no objective to be done this or anything like that. I'm asking about a world in which there is, in fact, no to be done this. Um, and uh, maybe most people are ignorant of that fact. And then, of course, again, of course, the twist, aha, that is our actual world, right? Um, there are a great many moral realists out there, right? Um, you know, poor saps like you who are laboring under this de delusion. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm free to, uh, maybe free ride off of your, uh, moral realism in that sort of way. Um, now I don't think that I'm necessarily doing that. I think that if you, if I were able to convince you to be a moral error theorist, you would live your life in the same way. Uh, and so we would all be able to have the same sort of. Uh, society. I'll come to that in a second. That's but right, I know, I know that's, that's I know that's 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 so we'll, we'll yeah. get to that in a second. But I, I do want to clarify that's not where I've started out. That's not where I've started out. Uh, my my point is simply that a lab an absence, a lack absence, a labsence of objective moral value um, would not make a difference uh, to how I experience the world and how I live my life. Uh, as far as I can tell. Uh, if I'm wrong, if there is uh, objective moral value, as far as I can tell, that's made no difference to any experience, any intuition that I've had, any event in my life so far. Um, if that were to go away, uh, if the good fairy or the evil fairy, as luck may have it, waved her magic wand and made all of morality go away, no one would know. How would we know that that had happened? It's not the sort of thing that would make a difference to our lives. That's why I don't believe in it, because it doesn't make a difference to anything in our lives. Um, and I think that's a great point, by the way. I think it's a great point because if something has no cause or efficacy, um, why think, why posit it? Right. Why have it in your ontology? So yeah. let's come back to that because I want to talk about that some more. But um, so first point then uh, is just from my own perspective, uh, I don't think that an absence of moral value would cause there to be any sort of differences in how I live my life. And in fact, I don't think there is any value and then it doesn't make a difference and I live my life and so do you and this is how everything works. But now, okay, second scenario. What if we're living in a society of error theorists? What if we're living in a society of error theorists? Um, so this depends on what sort of society we're talking about, what sort of imagined society we're talking about. And when, when people raise worries like this, what it seems they would imagine is something like, we all live our lives because our lives are regulated by our understanding of what the moral facts are. And then if we were to sacrifice our moral beliefs, give up on our moral beliefs, come to realize the truth that there's no objective um, uh, morality, no objective to be done this, the AK-47s would come out, right? Uh, and, and they would become awful. Well, I strongly doubt that. If you were to learn that there was no morality, right? If I'm able to convince you that there's no, no morality and, and you were to become an error theorist, um, what would you do? How would you live your life? Um, would, would you, uh, uh, Jason, pull out your AK-47 and, and start attacking young children? Uh, 
God, I hope not, right? And again, there's nothing incoherent about that. This is what I'm hoping from my evaluative perspective, but also from my knowledge of you, having seen the podcast and knowing what sort of a moral deliberator you are, I'm quite certain that you would not go about doing that. You have various moral compunction. And you might do a certain sort of reflection. You might say, is there anything behind this? I, I find mass murder abhorrent, even though mass murder is not to be abhorrent. Uh, I would never kill anyone, even though killing is not to be done. Um, so shall I kill? It seems, it seems bizarre to think that you would. Uh, like from your own perspective, ask you to seriously deliberate if I were somehow able to convince you or if me, uh, if I can't do it, right? The philosophy theory comes down and gives you the knowledge of error theory, right? Seriously, how would you live your life? And I don't really think it would be that much different from the way that you're living your life now. Maybe some differences around the yeah, edge. Maybe um, uh, if you uh, refrain from eating meat, because even though you really, really want to, uh, uh, but you feel like you know, you're dragged against your will away from eating meat, um, then you know, because, oh, I just got to do what I've got to live up to my moral obligations, then, yeah, you might eat more meat than you today um but i think for most people who are are ethical vegans it's not so much that they feel pulled by the force of the to be doneness of not eating meat it's that they have a feeling of sympathy for the suffering of animals and they don't want to uh participate in that uh activity and that feel that sympathy for the suffering of animals would continue and would continue to regulate your actions in that way um if you were to come to learn this there's no um moral truth right? You pick up the cheeseburger and you still in your mind's eye, see the suffering cow there and you still put it back down. Even if there's nothing to be done about putting that burger back down, right? The thought of the suffering is intense and important enough to you that you wouldn't eat it. And that's for, for everyone. That's how we live our lives. And so if we were all to have the magic wand waved and get the knowledge of error theory, Put into our heads. Sure, maybe there might be some uh, differences uh, around the edges, but I think mostly we would live our lives in accordance with what we care about and um, how we evaluate the world in a deep level from our own perspective. And that's just not going to change. I'm so glad that you brought up sympathy for other beings su suffering, for their for animal suffering, because before when you described what was wrong or how to explain what was wrong with mowing down the field of school ch children, you said, I can explain that by state that goes contrary to my desires. I don't want to do that. That's, that's what explains what's amiss there. Um, but now you're saying what explains what am what's amiss in eating a cheeseburger is that I care about, I have sympathy for the suffering of others. And that's a reason not to eat the cheeseburger. Well, I've got news for you. As a utilitarian, that's exactly what I would say. The utilitarian says that I knew that the suffering of those involved is a reason not to perform the action, and they just call that morality. So this let's distinguish here, right? Uh, there's the question of um, whether it is the suffering of others in itself or whether it is my concern for the suffering of others, which grounds the reason not to eat the cheeseburger. And I would say that it is my concern for the suffering of others, uh, which grounds my reason not to eat the cheeseburger. But as I was explaining when I, you know, going through the thoughts of, of um, you know, the, the feeling of horror you might have uh, when you pick up the cheeseburger and thinking about the poor cow, right? Um, what it's like to care about something, the phenomenology of it is other presenting, right? So an example I give uh, in the book is to think about like chocolate ice cream, right? Um, if you think about chocolate ice cream seems delicious to you, right? Think about that ice cream cone, right? Non-dairy ice cream cone, if you prefer. Um, uh, now, at a certain level, uh, I hope most people are broadly subjectivist about taste. Maybe there are some objectivists about uh, taste, but no, subjectivists about taste. You recognize that at some level, a chocolate ice cream cone is just something you like to eat, right? Uh, chocolate ice cream cone does not have to be savoredness to it, 
in some way, right? The fact that a chocolate ice cream cone seems delicious to you when it's in front of you, that's a fact about you. But from your perspective, as somebody who likes an ice cream cone, when you see an ice cream cone, it seems delicious to you. Now let's do the same thing with concern for others. Do the interests of others, does the suffering of others have a to-be-caredness about it to it? No. But if you are someone who cares about others, then when you think about the well-being of others, it just seems important to you in something like the way that when you just think about that chocolate ice cream cone, it seems delicious to you. Right. When I think about my 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 wife and my son, right, when I think about their, their happiness and their well-being, it immediately strikes me as being important to me. Um, now, if I'm uh, deluded by that, right, if I'm taken in by the illusion, I might take that to be an indication that the well-being of my wife and son has a to be cared aboutness or a to be pursuedness for me. But really what's going on is I'm somebody who cares about my wife and son. And what it's like to be someone who cares about my wife and son is to experience their interest as being a certain way, as being meaningful and important to me. And of course, I don't just care about my wife and son. I care about my family and friends, you know, other people and cows, right? So I care about a variety of things. And in caring about those things, Thinking about those things, about the well-being of others, strikes me as being a certain way. And that it strikes me as being a certain way is the rational grounds for my taking their interest into consideration. But again, this is not a matter of their interest having a truly taken into consideration-ness built into them. That's just what it is like to be someone who cares, which fortunately, we all are. So I want to press you a bit on this. Jason says... You don't need to make this extra claim, which is that if everyone becomes an air theorist, nothing much will change. It's an entirely empirical claim. Um, and as I say, we can go back in time when we had descriptively different moral accounts and people behaved pretty damn differently, right? People had slaves, people conquered, they raped, they killed, and now we don't do that stuff. So to make the claim that there's just no causal efficacy to people's moral beliefs just strikes me as false. Um it seems like one of the reasons why people were persuaded not to hold slaves wasn't just prudential. They started to believe other people matter. It wasn't just that they had a desire in themselves to feel sentiment towards others. They changed their minds. And the moral realist says, because it's actually true, right? Because it actually is the case that other people matter. So I think when we're comparing the two different worlds, you obviously can't say one's better than the other, the world with slavery or the world without slavery. Because better doesn't exist. You have a personal Objective preference. For right. I, I have a personal yeah. perspective. You can say right. from my perspective. You'd I prefer will evaluate that. things in that way. But yes, continue. I do always want to yes. put that caveat in, in there because you, you keep on trying to push things into the objective. And one of my central points is that it's a mistake to try to push things into the objective. We live our lives subjectively. And so I do evaluate and I do consider things to be better or worse. But continue. Yes. And this is where I want to push you further which is that you are an evaluator, okay? Because I think you're holding on to some of the illusion. Um, and you could say, once you really embrace the fact that there is no objective fact of the matter and that your moral attitudes and beliefs and practices are identical to your views about ice cream, then there is no persuasive power whatsoever. There's no point in trying to talk someone into liking kimchi or not. It would be a complete waste of time, right? And so if it happens to be the case, that over time, people really understand the full force of your argument. And they go, look, there is nothing wrong with torturing a baby to death, uh, having sex with it so that it dies. There's nothing wrong with that objectively. It's just a matter of taste. I like potatoes. You like potatoes. It doesn't matter at all. Mm -hmm. Once you create a culture of that, I imagine that over time, people's practices would change. You can imagine that the legal structures change so that there's no one punishing you. You have no prudential interest. Your own desires about the world change. You say, you know what? You know, there's this kind of cultural taboo about killing, but I've never killed anyone. I wonder what it would be like. I'm someone who likes new experiences. I currently don't really have a taste for raping babies, but why not have at it? There's nothing wrong with it objectively. Why don't I just be a bit of an experimental guy? Like I'll eat some kimchi, you know, I'll rape a baby. It's all identical. <laughs> right? your view, it's the same. 
then you can say, I don't want to rape babies because I have this weird evolved preference for it or my culture doesn't like it. Yeah, fine, but that's just your opinion, man. You know? <laughs> Someone else likes to do this stuff. That's fine because there's no objective answer on it. And I think that if we can imagine a world where the air theorists have really run amok, I don't know, 200 years, and this is a widespread belief and people say, let's experiment, let's try all the flavors of the row, other people don't matter at all, then we have a very different world. And of course, you're going to think, I don't like that given my current set of preferences, but objectively, there's nothing wrong with it. It's like everybody changed from uh, eating rice to eating noodles. So what? Sure. Oh, there's a lot in that. So I think one thing I'd say is I agree. This is a empirical uh, matter, which is also a speculative empirical matter at this point. Um, so I, I think that I am correct to say that if I were somehow to convince Mark and Jason to be error theorists, you wouldn't change how you live your life um, substantially. But if all of society were to become error theorists and this were to be hammered into people for hundreds of years, what would things look like? Well, I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, uh, let's assume for the sake of argument that you're right. Um, boy, man, I hope we don't teach people that Error theory is correct, and I hope we don't hammer that in for, for hundreds of years. Right? This is a, a well understood, you know, uh, idea in, in moral philosophy in general. Going back at least to, to Sidgwick, right? If utilitarianism is correct, that doesn't mean you should tell people to be utilitarians. Whether you should tell people to be utilitarians depends on whether or not telling people to be utilitarians will have the best consequences. And if making everyone be utilitarian will make everyone make exceptions for themselves and act in bad ways, then that would be bad. And so you shouldn't make people be utilitarian. I'm sure you're both familiar with this argument. It's a really cool argument. I love teaching this argument. Similarly, as somebody who cares about others, if you were to convince me, and hey, you make a pretty plausible case that if everyone were to be error theorists and if everyone to, were to have that pounded into them from a young age, that error theory is bad, that would lead to a, um, a society where two different things happen. One, everyone has true met ethical beliefs. And two, everyone rapes a lot of babies. Now, there's one thing that I like about that society, having true met ethical beliefs. There's another thing that I don't like about that society, the baby rape. And I don't like the second thing a lot more than I do the first thing. Um, if that were the case, then I would tone down the error theory a little bit, right? To try to prevent that uh, from happening. Because I really don't like baby rape. As with the utilitarian, again, we can distinguish, right? I'm not a, a truth uber alles sort of guy. I value truth. I care about truth. Um, that's why I'm a philosopher. Um, but there are other things that I care about. You know, there are certain sorts of things that I take for granted because um, society uh, has fortunately put me in a position where I can take them for granted. But if those were to be up in the air, well, I'd walk a little bit more carefully, as you would. But also, I want to add something in there, right? Because you're imagining the sort of like demoralizing process. I think it's important to remember, as you point out, society has gone through a moralizing process right? Over time. Uh, and that moralizing process hasn't happened because there are objective moral facts that we're increasingly recognizing and living up to because there are no such things. Rather, it's a normal pattern of social evolution, right? The spread of, of liberalism as a um, political tool right, to prevent conflict um, has led to peaceful and prosperous societies. And so this is why we now generally share liberal norms because societies that did a good job of inculcating liberal norms uh, don't kill babies norms did a better job of surviving peacefully and prospering than other sorts of societies. So there's a cultural evolution story that's uh, happening alongside that. Um, I, again, doubt that being an error theorist would undo all that cultural evolution overnight. But if we had good reason to think, again, that it would be, then I would recommend a different sort of education policy, right? Let's go back to the Republic, right? We get the secret truths that are taught only to the people who are in a position to appreciate them and act accordingly. For the rest of the people, the hoi polloi, the people with base metals in their soul, rather than the gold of us philosophers, you know, let's tell them things are right or wrong. Look, I have a lot of sympathy for your position because I'm an error theorist about social phenomena. So I don't believe in the existence of groups for many of the same reasons you have. 
uh, many of the arguments you use against morality are similar arguments to the ones I use against groups and social phenomena generally. They have no causal efficacy. It's just our beliefs about them that have ca causal efficacy. So, so that's something I just wanted to point out to Mark is he said that your position implies that moral beliefs have no causal efficacy, but that's not your position. They definitely do have causal efficacy. They've evolved society. It, what you're saying is the actual moral facts have no causal efficacy if they were to exist. That's correct. Um, so in, in a universe where you have moral facts and a universe where you don't have moral facts, you could have identically behaving people because... In, in both, you could have moral beliefs, and those moral beliefs cause people to act in certain ways. Um, and by moral beliefs, I just mean beliefs about morality, not that they are morally correct beliefs. Yes. Um, Although yeah. I would so add I that for most people, what's really doing the driving isn't um, so much the moral belief, it's the moral attitudes. Again, right, there, there are the two stories we might tell about why you don't eat the cheeseburger, right? One is that you look at the cheeseburger and you say, it is objectively morally wrong for me to eat this cheeseburger. Moral uh, wrongness is a certain sort of fact. There's a certain fact of to be doneness. And in recognizing the existence of to be doneness, that has a certain uh, rational impact on my motivation, such that I recognize that I'm rationally obligated to put down the cheeseburger. And then you do. The second story is, oh, God, think of the poor cow. Oh, I can't do it. And for almost everyone, there are some people who are weird. Spencer is weird. Spencer is one of those first kind of people, right? But those very, very weird people. This has been studied psychologically, right? Um, uh, for most people, what motivates us is not our moral beliefs. It is instead our moral attitudes, right? It's the second story, which is much, much more common psychologically than the first sort of story. Um, uh, this is why I have some, some to, to doubt uh, Mark's story, the effects of everyone being an error theorist. Um, because he's imagining this being uh, error theory being put at us in such a way that it is um, psychologically grinding in a way in an attempt to erode your, uh, your moral commitments as well. But these are really distinct cognitive phenomena, right? The sorts of things that horrify you and your cognitive judgments of this has a property of to be horrified about this. And you can get rid of the second one, and that's not going to touch the first one. And we're going to continue to operate on our feeling of, of horror. Um, now, again, I think there's a case we made that moral beliefs do play some role in some cases, and perhaps this explains some of our um, moral progress, like we were just discussing. But I do want to emphasize that uh, for the most part, um, moral action and social coordination and social evolution of moral norms is driven by um, attitudes and by quasi-Darwinian uh, selection uh, at the social level on those attitudes rather than by um, explicit philosophical moral deliberation. Most people don't do explicit philosophical moral deliberation, and yet. Sure. I think when I say that there's moral beliefs, I'm not saying that people do a utility calc in their head or they consult Kant's um, critique of pure reason um, or a list of his categorical imperatives. They just think that's wrong. It's wrong to do that. Uh, they have this intuition that it's wrong. Um, I just want to go back to what Mark said earlier, where he said, uh, do you believe in any, do you believe in any values? Um, so he mentioned meaning um, and you said, I'm not so sure about meaning. Um, really what's going on there is it's just intense desire or central desire. Um, <clears throat> but I was wondering whether you believe in any, uh, in, in any values at all. Um, because if you were to convince people, let's say you didn't believe in the existence of any values, um, and you were to convince someone of that position, not just uh, moral anti-realism, but all value anti-realism, then it seems like you might arrive at the position where you have no reason to get out of bed in the morning. Uh, and you have no reason to do or not do anything. If you had a whole society of those people, uh, you wouldn't even have the moral attitudes. Uh, so I, as I said at the beginning, I like a sort of Humean theory of reason. So I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, a skeptic about all sorts of reasons and all sorts of value. I'm uh, a skeptic about categorical uh, reasons and categorical values. Uh, I accept what some would call a reductive naturalist account of Humean reasons, right? 
uh, of the kind that you might see defended by someone like Mark Schroeder and Slaves of the Passions, right? Saying that what it is to have a reason for action just is for some consideration, uh, the thing that is the reason to be part of an explanation of why acting in that way will satisfy some of your desires, right? Um, so, so in that sense, I do believe in the existence of reasons. My, the scope of my skepticism extends to categorical normativity. Uh, that is to say, all reasons, uh, all valuing that can't be explained in that sort of way in terms of uh, uh, analyzing that notion in terms of uh, what desires you have and what will promote the satisfaction of those desires. With again, desires in a very, very broad sense to can cover your deepest concerns and cares, like my love for my fans. It's categorical normativity. It's to be doneness or to be pursuedness that I'm uh, skeptical of. Why not then just have a watered down version of morality? So why not? Why don't you permit that? So something like saying there are reasons for me to act, and those reasons are my desires and beliefs. Um, there are also reasons for the agents around me. They have their own reasons for action. They have their own desires and beliefs. My actions affect. They are either in accordance with or not in accordance with my desires and beliefs, my reasons for action, but they also impact other people's desires. Um, and so the utilitarian says, well, all that utilitarianism is it's a description of whether your actions positively enhance or help to promote the desires of others, as well as your own, or not. And insofar as it promotes the desires of others, promotes those desires to be satisfied, it is stipulatively called a moral act. And if it's, if it doesn't, it's not a moral action. Um, if it frustrates those desires, why not just permit that? If you're granting re ra rationality, if you're granting reasons, why not grant reasons other than your own as having importance? Um, so you mentioned, uh, we might stipulatively call these morality. Yes, we might stipulatively call these morality. But I don't care what we would stipulate we call about morality. I care about what we actually call morality. Uh, there's a great line from uh, C.L. Stevenson that I love, um, where he's like, uh, we could define good as being pink with yellow trimmings, right? And just use the word good to mean pink with yellow trimmings. We could adopt that convention, um, but that would not be a convention we'd adopt that would remotely do justice to what sort of thing we're doing when we're talking about morality. Um, it's a radically revisionary account. Too radically revisionary. Too radically revisionary. We can adopt whatever convention we want. But when I say there's no morality, what I'm not saying is that there is nothing that we might call morality. We could call anything morality. We could call being pink with yellow trimmings morally good if we wanted. What I care about is our actual concept of morality um, and whether or not there's anything that answers to our actual concept of morality. So the debate here is over uh, what uh, Richard Joyce, the era theorist Richard Joyce calls the, uh, the non-negotiable commitments of our concept of morality. And I follow Joyce in saying that categoricity is a non-negotiable aspect of our concept of morality. If we learn that there are things that we might call morality, because we might call anything morality if we wanted, the pink with yellow trimmings, we might call morality. Um, you know, that's, sure, there might be that we, we might call uh, morality, but if, if, there is, if there's nothing that has the feature of being categorically normative, then that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about morality. And so I think the clearest way to make Joyce's point is to think about what a, the sort of watered down morality um, that you're talking about, Jason, uh, would look like, right? We're not talking about things that have a to be desiredness to them. What we're talking about is things that we do, in fact, care about. And can we use moral terms to talk about things that we do, in fact, care? Care about. Who is the we here? Well, it's going to be socially relative, right? Different people in different societies are going to care about different sorts of things. So, okay, we could use the term morality to talk about what I individually care about, or perhaps 
what we as a society tend to care about and tend to tell each other to care about sort of the norms that we socially reinforce. And we do study this. We do know what this is. This is what anthropologists do. This is what anthropologists study. They'll go into society and they'll study the norms and practices. They'll see what is praised and blamed, what is promoted, what is condemned, right? And they'll write down, you know, in this group of people, you know, they praise this and they blame this and do that and they do the other thing. Um, now, imagine you take uh, an anthropologist and put it in you know, contemporary Western society to describe contemporary Western norms. And they write the definitive book of here's what, um, uh, you know, here's what people care about in contemporary Western society. Would that be a book of moral philosophy or would that be a book of descriptive anthropology? Now here I can only rely on my intuitions here about how I would apply the concept of morality, right, moral philosophy, as opposed to descriptive anthropology. I strongly have the intuition that would not be a book of moral philosophy, that would be a book of descriptive anthropology. So when you're asking for a watered down morality, we just talk about the things that one might care about, that one might call moral, or even stronger, what we do care about, what we do call moral, what we're talking about there is descriptive anthropology, which is not watered down morality. That's something else. It's descriptive anthropology. And if the only sort of facts that exist are descriptive anthropological facts, there are no heavyweight moral facts, well, then I would take that to be evidence, conclusive proof, really, that there is no moral facts. There are no moral facts. If all that we can talk about is descriptive anthropological facts, then there's no morality to talk about, which is what I think. So let's say it's the case that you're correct. There are no moral facts. It seems like you subjectively hold some kind of normative moral account based on your preferences or your makeup. Is it possible to persuade others that your account is a better account than theirs? How does that conversation go if there is no metaphysical grounding for it? How do you say to someone else who holds a different normative account, you should rather hold mine. Easily. You should rather hold mine. You can use moral language. Why not? So this is something I, I talk about uh, briefly in, in chapter eight and developing a uh, work of mine in, a, in an earlier paper um, where I say, look, how should we live moral language? How should we use moral language? How should we talk with one another? How should we deliberate with one another? Um, I might talk with one another. I might deliberate by using moral language. Now, there's some good things about that or some, and some bad things about that. Again, from my perspective, some things I like about that and some things I don't like about that. Here's one thing that I don't like about that. Um, it's deceptive, right? If I call something morally wrong, you will take me to believe that it really is morally wrong. And I don't believe that anything is really morally wrong. wrong. So in that way, I am deceiving you. Um, not a big fan of deception. So that counts against using a moral language. Here's something that's good about using moral language. I might convince you, and I might want to convince you, right? And not perhaps for uh, narrow ma manipulative sort of things, right? Uh, I'm confronting the sociopath with the AK-47, right? I'm encountering uh, Genghis Khan, the sword blood maximizer, right? Um, I find the way that they're living their lives abhorrent, and I'd like to talk them down. And perhaps I would stand a better chance of doing so if I used more language to persuade them rather than saying, I really, I'd really prefer you wouldn't. Um, and because moral language does have this socially coordinative character, um, as Richard Joyce argues in uh, The Evolution of Morality, that's why we have moral language. That's why these moral concepts and the practice of using moral language evolved first biologically and then sociologically on top of it. Uh, is in order to facilitate this coordinated function. Um, by using more language, then I can tap into that to uh, make effective my desires about how other people uh, live their lives. Now, I also don't like being manipulative, right? Just like I don't being deceptive. So that that counts against, and that's gonna that's gonna balance out. So in a lot of cases, I try to avoid using uh, more language, right? Uh, I'll try to uh, refer to the sorts of things that. I take most people to care about and tap into the things that I take most people to care about. Um, but uh, if I'm dealing with the, the sword blood maximizer, right, and I've got good reason to think, you know, uh, uh, a moral slap on the side of the head, my God, you're being a monster. Look at yourself, right? Um, this is wrong. This is 
awful, right? You're violating their rights, the right, all the moral language you might use. If I have reason to think that that would be effective, then of course I'd use moral language in that, in that context, right? How can I speak uh, morally? By speaking morally. Will I speak morally? Ah, that depends on the context. Usually no, but sometimes yes. It depends. Sounds a little bit like being an atheist preacher who wants your flock to uh, behave in a certain way. You go, I don't believe any of this horse shit. If I talk about Jesus and God and lightning bolts and stuff, well, you'll act the way I want you to. Sure, but there's more of a, a sort of um, unity to my account than the atheist preacher's account, right? Because my whole account is based on trying to act effectively in ways that will promote the things that I sincerely care about, right? And if I sincerely care about certain ends being promoted, right? Um, and I see others acting in ways that would fail to promote those uh, ends, and I can change the way they act by persuading them, and I can persuade them by using moral language, then I will have good reason by the lights of my own theory to speak to them in a certain sort of way. So this isn't an incidental sort of thing, right, where the, uh, the atheist preacher is being deceptive in certain ways, uh, is trying to act morally, rationally in certain ways, um, and doing so by, by um, promoting uh, false uh, theistic beliefs. I've got a sort of um, synergy in my way of thinking and talking about practical rationality, which is that uh, I speak and I act in uh, ways that are sensible from my perspective in order to facilitate the, uh, the promotion of the things that I care about the most. Sorry, maybe that wasn't uh, fully uh, coherent there, but hopefully you see what I'm trying to get at. Well, Matt, it's been an absolute delight having you on the show. Um, really enjoyed having the discussion. It's one of the most fundamental discussions you can have. Um, it's one of those things where I think people have a strong belief in morality, even though they can't touch it or taste it. And so it's good to hear the, the counter perspective and to see what views you can hold that are compatible with each other.